welcome to the story worthy hour of power and story smash the storytelling game show my name is christine blackburn i am here in los angeles i hope your pandemic is going well how's everybody out there tonight i'm just so happy you tuned in we've got an amazing show planned for you guys this is our 18th show in a row and we just keep bringing you the entertainment every Sunday night, and tonight is no exception. Later on in the show, we've got the amazing comedian Judy Gold coming up, and also comedian Greg Proops, supermodel Eugenia Kuzmina, and comedian Dan Green. And in the after show, Blank Apache will be here, and he'll be helping out Judy and Greg to play Story Smash, the storytelling game show which as you know, is just sweeping the nation. It's everybody's favorite game to play in these social distance times. I hope you guys have had a good week. I had a pretty good week. Uh, yeah, everything's pretty normal around here. It's been hot in Los Angeles, as you know, a lot of fires, that's no good. All right, look at this, the room is filling up. This is good, I'm just uh, killing some time, waiting for people to park. Get yourself together, get yourself a beverage. We'll start the show in just a moment. Once again, we've got four amazing talents coming up to tell a true 10 minute story. And I'm gonna share a few stories in there as well. And then we're playing Story Smash, the storytelling game show. Yay! It's just been a lot of fun, you guys. Uh, my daughter, she is being homeschooled, as you know, of course. She's in eighth grade and uh, I'll tell you what, I pass by her bedroom and I see her online and I hear the teacher talking to the children and I say, give the teachers all the money. This teacher that she has is so patient and so wonderful. Her whole school is, and I'm just uh, super lucky to be going through this with my daughter at a good school, as it were. Anyway, you guys, we'll get started right away because we always have uh, just an amazing packed hour of talent and games and it's just such a blast the first hour of course is 10 minute stories the second hour we'll be playing the game show but let's start right now now the first talent you're going to hear from from uh tell a story tonight she was recently on story worthy my podcast and she was so funny and so engaging i knew i wanted you guys to meet her She's actually a supermodel, a real supermodel. And she's been in magazines like Vogue and Elle, every magazine you can think of really. She's been in campaigns for Dior and L'Oreal and Hermes and a lot of other designers that I can't pronounce. And my favorite thing about this girl, she's a Capricorn like me and she was born on December 25th, Christmas day, isn't, isn't that cool? All right, you guys, please put your hands together for the very talented Eugenia Kuzmina. Eugenia. I'm unmuted. Hi, everybody. Um, Christine, thank you so much. It's so exciting to be here and uh, share stories. I haven't talked for the last month, but not because I'm a blonde model and can't talk because I actually went to silent retreat with my husband. Um, and, you know, there I found out, if you guys know anything about silent retreat, I found out that it's really a weird place because, uh, you know, the teacher would say, okay, let me talk to you about mindfulness. You have to be able to think about thinking. And I was like, I'm a model, I don't think. But today's story is not about that. I first, I thought to tell a story about how I am a model mom and things like that, you know, but then I decided to tell a completely different story it's a story about how, as a child, I was a compulsive liar. It's true. It's a pretty vulnerable subject. Um, and that's what happened. When I was a child, I saw this cartoon in Russia, which was about an elephant. And the elephant was this really cool character. And he was getting away with being a rebel and a liar. Of course, I didn't see this cartoon till the end, so I didn't know what was the moral of the story. And being at that age, about eight or nine, I decided it's a good idea to rebel against my mom, you know, how kids at that age decide to kind of find a voice of their own. And I decided to start just casually compulsive lying. First, I started with really easy projects, you know, like faking, 
my sickness and not going to school. And it was very easy. You put a thermometer, you know, somewhere really warm, which is hard to find in Russia, but I found, you know, like a way to boil the water and then put the thermometer next to it. And I got away. I think, you know, I was acting pretty well at that time. Um, after a while, uh, you know, it was too easy. So I decided to upgrade my skills and try to see if I can get away with more things. And at that point, I was scratching my grades and upgrading them for the next level. In Russia, there's um, a certain measurements, you know, there's a system from one to 10 grade, and I would just add a zero or, you know, find a way to kind of casually be creative with math. I got so good at this that at some point I almost opened a business in school, you know, and the business was like, if you want to upgrade your grades, just come to Eugenia. <laughs> um, worked for a while, you know, had to close the business, but every business goes down as an entrepreneur. I decided to keep going. And my next thing was a very elaborate lie. Basically, we have this neighbor who was this amazing lady, she lived next door, and we used to come and have some tea at her apartment. And I remember, you know, we didn't have a lot of toys at the time. It was post-Soviet Russia, so we were really creative, you know, and using our mind, not always to the good way. Um, but this lady, she had this incredible handcrafted Fabergé egg in her you know, hole when you come through her apartment. And if you don't know what Fabergé egg is, it's uh, this little egg which was created by Alexander III. And basically it's a super, super expensive egg and it's a tradition, you know, to keep it. It's almost like a fortune if you have it. So I was passing by, of course, I didn't know the history of anything, but it was shiny and interesting enough. And I thought if I just take this egg, I could get away maybe with lying that I didn't take it. I negotiated for a while, and one day I decided to go through. I took the egg, hid it in my pocket, walked out casually, and then, you know, decided to show it to my friends a few days later. I would wait for it and hide it under my bed. Of course, you know, a few days passed, nothing was happening, and I almost, on the third day, decided to bring this egg and show it to all my friends and brag about it, about this toy in post-Soviet Russia. And my mom came up to me and she was like, did you take the egg? Like, be honest with me, you know, just, you can tell me if it is a lie. And I was like, well, uh, no. And my mom, believe me, she was completely convinced that her child is her child and there's no way that her child would lie. And I was so happy, I excited, I succeeded, you know, my rebellion, my lie, and being like in a Russian cartoon, that elephant that lies was very exciting for a while. And then my mom came back a day later and she said, well, the neighbor is calling the police, so you better tell me now. At that point, I was like, okay, I got it. This is a lying competition, right, mom? So who's gonna outlie one another now? But then I look into her eyes and to be honest, there is this point when you just look at somebody's eyes and you really can see that they're not lying. She was not lying about the police coming. And it's not even that that motivated me to say the truth. I suddenly just felt so ashamed and didn't want to get, go on. You know, for me, being connected to my mom was so important. And I, I broke down. We talked about it and we're crying for a few hours. And I realized that lying is just not worthy, you know? And now that I have my kids, I try to teach them this moral. You know, I try to show them the cartoon till the end and teach them that it's so important to be the truth and not be perfect and make mistakes. So before yesterday, I come home and my daughter is really quiet. And I go to her room, I'm like, and the candies are missing. And I'm like, Veronica, did you take the candy? You don't need to lie. Like, it's fine, you know? It's fine if you, you know, you're not perfect, you ate all the candy, and she's like, looking at me. She's like, no. Well, I guess the moral of the story is, sometimes it's, your, it's in your DNA, <laughs> and the fruit doesn't fall too far from the tree. <laughs> um, 
still exploring to be not perfect parent and having not perfect kids, but I'm sure we'll come to the moment where, you know, we can share everything. And that's the point of the story. Just tell the truth and be vulnerable. And thank you so much, Christine. This was not planned. And I just wiped the story on the spot. <laughs> wow, that's amazing. Eugenia Kuzmina, thank you so much. That's a great story, Eugenia. I, you know, this is our 18th show and I've told, you know, 17 stories. And I'll tell you what, about three of them were about me lying. <laughs> Why do that. we do that? <laughs> I guess we connect all as humans. I guess it's just a, uh, it's such a crazy thing. I lied about uh, stealing a hamster when I was 12 and that wasn't a big lie. You know, that wasn't a big lie, but other things as well, like cheating on guys and I would get away with it. I hate that about myself. I don't want to, I don't want to lie. Maybe we'll share while. some DNA. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, hey, let me tell you something. If I share any of Eugenia's Kuzmina's DNA, I'll take it. I'll take yours. <laughs> <laughs> All right. You're so sweet. Thank you so much, Eugenia. That was adorable. Thank you, guys. All right, you guys. This next guy, he is a fan. <laughs> was that Melanie? Melania? Was that melanoma? It was, Mil it was Melania, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Why do you have her book? Uh, because I'm not a Russian spy. I'm just a gold digger. <laughs> <laughs> crazy you're so funny <laughs> all right you guys this it's next guy coming up he's fantastic he's been on the story worthy podcast a couple of times and he's just such a good person he uh, has several comedy albums probably six or seven and his latest comedy album is called the resistance which he filmed live in san francisco and he also has a hit podcast along with his wife it's called the smartest man in the world and i gotta tell you it is such a great show they record the podcast all over the world when we're not in a pandemic and he's also part of the fabulous improv team whose line is it anyway with dave foley and ryan styles you guys this guy has rabid fans and you're gonna be one too please put your head your hands together for my friend greg proops how is everybody but there's no light <laughs> how impromptu whoa now there's too much light there we go hi can I be heard? All right. I'll just presume I can be. Christine, can you hear me? Okay. I don't see very well. Uh, I haven't since I was a kid. I got glasses in like third grade. And um, I know that for the people who wear glasses, uh, a lot of people who uh, aren't, uh, you know, ocularly challenged, who can see the sighted, um, are very arrogant. Uh, and also at the same time, of course, wildly insecure because they know that we are smarter than you. Um, people who wear glasses are smarter than you. We spend all of our time poring over old manuscripts and uh, filling in, uh, you know, uh, brass beatings of medieval scenes and whatnot. And we've ruined our eyesight because of it. And uh, that's because we work so hard. In any case, uh, I uh, had to go to the doctor a couple of weeks. I've been going to the doctor. I have glaucoma. And um, I can also assure you of one thing. This doesn't cure it, because if it did, I would have been cured when I was, you know, 16. So I got the glaucoma, and uh, it means like you can't see. It gradually gets bigger, 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 the, how much you can't see. And I've been under the, uh, uh, the I was going to say under the care of this doctor. I had unnoticed in uncertain terms, no uncertain terms, the either, either set of terms, uh, the uncertain or the no certain, um, was being cared for by a top ophthalmologist and she uh would check my pressure right which is you check the pressure in your eyes if the pressure gets too high you're gonna go blind one so i go in one day and she's like mm, this isn't good and i'm like and she's like yeah um i'm gonna give you some drops and i'm gonna let you go out and wait and uh, i'll take the pressure again so we went out waited half an hour came back my wife and i and uh i came back and she went before she took the reading pray. And I was like, okay, look, I, I didn't take a Hippocratic oath or anything, but were I in your shoes as a medical professional, I would um, rely on casting my fate to the winds and the whims of the gods a little less and work a little more toward the scientific method here where you might have a solution to my blindness. 
So she goes, um, your left eye is, yeah. And I'm like, okay, what does that mean? She's like, you need surgery like now. So I <laughs> called the doctor, I got an appointment with her and she was um, authoritative and brisk, uh, not a lot of mess. And uh, she goes, um, yeah, your left eye is pretty much ready to go. And I go, well, I've got to go to Australia for two weeks and I do a comedy tour. And she goes, uh, oh, just to make the story better with Brad and Colin from Whose Lines Is It Anyway. Not my usual group, but two other girls were going down there. Uh, Sydney, Opera House, whatnot. Bloody marvelous, right? I don't know if you've ever been to Oz in uh, uh, New Zealand, but um, the food is to die for. And uh, what are we checking out? I love it. I'm getting distracted in the middle of my story. So uh, she goes, I go, I have to go to Australia for two weeks. And she goes, oh, go to Australia. I'm like, what? what? There's, a, there's an Australian out? Uh, so my advice to you, if you find that you have a, a glaucoma and you need a, an immediate operation, just say to the doctor, I've got to go to Australia. And evidently you get a couple of weeks reprieve. So she gave me a dazzling series of pills to take to keep the pressure down when I was there. And I mean like 17 different pills and 50 drops and whatnot. Uh, and so I was having these hallucinatory dreams and I dreamed that Brian Williams, yes, Brian Williams from MSNBC was trying it on me real hard. And he smelled fantastic, no tie, white shirt, it was interesting. So I'm telling Colin this the next day, and I'm like, uh, yeah, I had a Brian Williams dream last night. That, and uh, of course the story would be better if it went all the way. Um, so let's just say it did. Mm. I get back from Australia and I'm clapped into surgery. And uh, she, uh, um, you know, you're wheeled into a room, even though it's your eyes, you have to take all your clothes off and, and um, uh, I wore a, a very, very racy, I don't know if you're a, 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 you know, a jungle cat fan. It was an ocelot skinned, uh, sort of a speedo for a fair. I don't know what time we're at now. I don't know how much time I have left. I think I haven't run over. Um, wheeled in, you know, they put the thing, a hairnet on your head, put the thing in your arm, a whole enchilada. First doctor comes up to me and he goes, hello, Greg, I'm Dr. Berlin. And I'm like, um, one thing that people of Semitic persuasion don't want to hear when they're uh, are going to be on an operating table is that the doctor's name Berlin. It brings back too many, too many terrible cultural memories. Then he goes, I'm your anesthesiologist. And this is how this works. I'm going to give you a mild sedative. And I'm like, mild sedative? Those, is that like the most disappointing phrase in the English language, mild sedative? Um, it's like, I want a non-alcoholic champagne cocktail. I want a, a I want Justin Bieber to sing some Ray Charles. It's, uh, it's really disappointing. You're like, mild sedative, um, no. I want to climb the Everest of high. I want to be Colin Farrell at Sean Connery's wake. You know what I mean? That's how high I want to be. I want to be uh, Mickey Rourke when his chihuahua uh, crosses the sticks. I, I want to be high. I don't want to feel anything. They're working on my eye, right in my eye with a needle in your eye. Cross my heart, hope to fucking die. So he gives me the mild sedative. They wheel me into the room. My doctor's there and she tapes my head to the table with like duct tape and then gives me a million drops. They're pouring all over me. And uh, she goes, um, try not to move your head. And I'm like, I'll do what I can. And then she, they wheel me in, lower me onto the thing, put me on the table and she goes, relax. And I'm like, that is so reassuring. At one point she goes, uh, uh, there's a lot of blood. And I'm like, well, you know, I don't want to be the victim here, but really there's nothing I can do about that. Um, I think you uh, should take the, uh, take the steering wheel as it were and um, reduce the blood flow out of my eye. I'd appreciate that. Uh, as a patient, hearing you blurt that out sort of to everyone. Then later, uh, she stuck a needle in my eye. I went in far enough that I felt it. I moved a little and she went, um, are you okay? And I went, I've had um, better days. Anyway, we finish and uh, then uh, my eyesight was bad before that. How bad was it? Well, I'd be driving around with my wife and she'd go, uh, I'd, I'd be like, what does that sign say? And she'd be like, stop. And I'd be like, no, I wanna know what that sign says. And she's like, stop. Anyway, that's been my story. And I guess the moral of it is, um, oh, stay in school. Wow. Greg Proops. That was amazing. Thank you so much. That was such a great story. I, I, I just like, I love you so much.
I think you're an amazing person. How how is your pandemic going, uh, Greg? <laughs> I'm in a good I'm in a good mood today because um, I get to do this show with y'all, and then um, my wife and I are going to record the podcast. And uh, Jennifer is her name. She's her name is not my wife. And uh, so I'm I'm in a good mood today for some reason. I don't know. Usually I wake up churning with hatred because I'm so hacked off at the state of affairs, and I want uh, the election to come and be over, and you know, uh, uh, have hope come back into our lives instead of this constant uh, noise machine that makes everybody so agitated. Yeah, I, I don't hear think you. we should be. Uh, I mean, we have to work really hard, but uh, I don't think you know that they create the chaos so that we'll feel anxiety. That's how this works. It's not mm. th that we're anxious because thing they you know they've got their own alternate reality they're running, and that's what makes us freaked out. Yeah. I hear you. Right. Yeah, I hear you, man. It's just every day it's something new and it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's upsetting for sure. But hopefully in about 50 days, everything's going to change. Oh, yeah. we'll, get, we'll get back on track. That's what we need to happen for sure. Uh, yeah. Thanks, Greg. I really appreciate it. You always have a Bye, lot darling. To Thank you so much. I'll see you in a minute. Yeah. See you back on Story Smash at the top of the hour. I know okay. you're going to be a fantastic judge. I know that for sure. Now, uh, also with Story Smash tonight, I'm so excited. Like even right now, there are so many people in the room right now. This is our highest number yet. We've got so many people in the room. I'm going to have to upgrade my Zoom, my Zoom membership. You know, there's different levels. That's like a thing now in the vernacular. You know it is, the whole Zoom thing. And so I will up my membership and I'll have to get, I'll just get myself a, a bigger a bigger membership, more people in the room. I think we can go up to 10,000. If we get up to 10,000 fans on the Story Worthy Hour of Power and Story Smash, the storytelling game show, well, we need to have a Netflix show, God damn it. And so you guys, if you agree, say yeah in the chat room. Yeah. Anyway, over the last 17 weeks, 18 weeks, the entire summer, I've been telling you guys a lot of personal stories about my life, about my family, growing up in Pittsburgh, being a flight attendant, going to the Peace Corps, and relationships. Yeah, a lot of those. But one thing I haven't told you guys is about my love of music. Some of you guys out there who know me well, you know how much music means to me and how much it's a part of my life. So tonight I thought I'd share two quick music stories. Uh, the first one is I play uh, the ukulele. I believe I played it for you guys a few weeks ago and I play guitar and I play piano. And it's pretty much my favorite thing to do is to sit down and play music. I don't write any music. I'm not that kind of talent, but I just like to sit and jam. And especially Neil Young, you know, Neil Young, he's just, you know, been around for, I think he was born in 54, it's about, I think he's about 74. Anyway, the point is he's in his seventies, he's getting older, but he's got about 47 albums. And it's just my whole life has been, you know, really a Neil Young soundtrack almost. And it began when I was about 13 years old, my brother, Scotty, he had a Panasonic stereo, but it wasn't just a turntable. It was also a cassette player, a radio, and an eight track player. Yeah, who remembers the eight track? And he got the album Live Rust. And that was the first time I kind of had my mind blown because it was a two album set. And on one side of the album, he played the song Hey, hey, my, my, you guys know that, right? Hey, hey, my, my, rock and roll will never die. And he played that in, a, in an electric version. It was a really loud screaming song. And then in the, on the other side, or the, the first song on the other side was the same song, but instead of hey, hey, my, my, he called it my, my, hey, hey, and he played it in an acoustic version. And for some reason at 13 years old, my mind was blown. And that prompted me to start playing guitar. And that prompted me to start playing a lot of Neil Young music. I got this book when I was about 14. And you could see it's like totally worn out. But I'll bet you I play songs from this book, you know, once, twice a month, honestly. It's so funny. I just have always had such a, such a kinship for his music. So I had a friend named Charlie Shannon. Charlie Shannon was a comedy writer, an incredibly bright comedian. 
just a super guy. And when I first moved to Los Angeles in 1997, 23 years ago, Charlie and I became friends. And we would go to comedy gigs together and we'd go out to lunch together. And he was just a really good person. He supported me. And actually, let me share quickly the way I met Charlie. I was at a party, uh, a party. We were both at the same party. And I was over the food table and I put these little things in my mouth. I thought it was, I think I thought it was like a brownie or something. And I put it in my mouth. And I, then all of a sudden it was like, what? And it was horrible. And I run into the kitchen and I spit it out in the sink and I'm rinsing my mouth out. And this guy behind me, he goes, what's, what's going on? And I go, oh my God. It's like, this was like a cocktail weenie. Who brings these little cocktail weenies to a party? And he goes, I brought the cocktail weenies. <laughs> and so that was the first time I met Charlie Shannon. That party, they had a pinata in the house. Not a great idea. But nonetheless, Charlie and I became friends. And Charlie's brother is named T. Sean Shannon. And he happened to be the showrunner at Saturday Night Live at that time. T. Sean has done a tremendous amount of work as well. And at that time, like I said, he was the, uh, the showrunner on Saturday Night Live. So one night, Neil Young was going to be on Saturday Night Live. And Charlie went to New York because he's not going to miss that. And his brother gave him a ticket and everything. And Charlie was so excited to be there. And he had his cell phone. He snuck it into the stage. He snuck it in. And during when Neil Young played live on the stage, he called me and let me listen to it on his cell phone. Like his brother could have gotten totally busted and he could have like gotten Tishon, his brother, in a lot of trouble. But he did that for me. Just a great guy. And then after the show, Tishon uh, got Charlie backstage and Charlie got an album signed by Neil Young. And it was so special to him. And fast forward, unfortunately and very sadly, my friend Charlie died of a... Uh, uh, I think it was his heart. It was just unexpected. It was really sad. He was only 42 years old. And it just, you know, it broke my heart. We had a big, uh, you know, memorial thing for him at a comedy club and a bunch of people went. And anyway, Charlie, he, uh, or Tishon was there, of course, and he gave me this framed picture of Neil Young that Neil gave to Charlie. It says, to Charlie, from Neil Young, and it gives me shivers to just even hold it. And Neil, this is his very first album. Uh, everybody knows this is nowhere. He did this album in, uh, I think it was 1966. It's his first album. He was only 19 years old. Unbelievable. So anyway, I continue to love Neil Young. I've not met him yet, but that's on the bucket list. And so that was my first story I wanted to share with you about my love of Neil Young. Uh, someday I might come out and play a few tunes for you here on the show if I, <laughs> if I have the nerve. You know when I said I played the ukulele a few weeks ago? Well, as you know, this show goes up onto YouTube after the show. And you know, when I was editing it, I cut out the ukulele because I just, I don't know. I could stand up and talk to anybody, but standing up and playing music is a different thing. So uh, anyway, I'm trying to get more, more confidence and hopefully that'll happen. Okay, the next story I wanted to talk to you guys about, uh, this is about my buddy David Wilde. Now, David has been on the show before, and David is a music producer. He was the editor, not the editor, but one of the lead writers at Rolling Stone Magazine back in the day. And now he's a producer for all sorts of music-related television shows, including all the Grammy Awards. And he recently did that Prince tribute, Let's Go Crazy. He did the Beatles tribute, the Elton John tri tribute. He just does all those big shows that they shoot down at the Shriners Auditorium here in Los Angeles. And he knows that I love music. And so in 2015, he was producing another show. It was called Shining a Light. It was a concert for progress on race in America. And this day was the rehearsal day. They were shooting, I think, that night. So it was just like that day was the rehearsal. And it was at the Shrine Auditorium that holds, you know, several thousand people. And David asked me if I wanted to go down and watch the rehearsal. And I'm like, yes, I will be there and I want to watch the rehearsal. And so I go down there and I get this special pass. 
I park my car at a parking meter. I get the pass. I go in. Huge auditorium. But the only people there are the crew, right? So you got the camera guy and like maybe 10 people on the camera crew. You got the sound guys. You got the producers like my friend David Wilde. And then, then you have who's on the stage. So there's nobody there essentially. So I sat like in the 10th row and I'm watching right there. I mean like, you know, 20 yards away, I'm watching John Legend. I'm watching Alicia Keys. Sting came on the stage and was singing and uh, Pharrell Williams. And it was just, it was unbelievable, right? Because I'm just like, I love concerts, I love music, and I'm seeing all these people that I love so much in a rehearsal. So it was like really intimate. And, you know, you, they hear the director speaking and do this, do that. And so David looks at me and he goes like this, Christine, come here, come here, come here. And I walk down and he says, sit here in the front row. And I'm like, what? And he goes, yeah, sit in the front row. Wait till you see who's coming out. And I'm like, okay, okay. And I'm so psyched and I sit in the front row and I'm sitting beside Lynette Carolla, who's Adam Carolla's wife. And she's a friend of David's as well. So she's sitting there and I check, you know, say hello to her, chat with her for a minute. And then all of a sudden, right in front of my eyes, <laughs> walks on flipping Bruce Springsteen, right? And he's just a tiny guy. And he's so he's in the jeans and the t-shirt and he's talking at about this level and he's very quiet and there's a huge band behind him. I mean, there must be 10 people behind him plus a bunch of backup singers. And Bruce is just like, you know, uh, all right, you guys, we're going to take it from the top. One, two, three, boom, you know, and then all this music comes out and it was just like, wow, it was just fascinating and fabulous. And I couldn't believe I was there. And then all of a sudden, my phone goes off in my pocket. It's my alarm. My parking meter is going to run out. I'm a single mom. I live in Los Angeles. I can't get a parking ticket. I mean, if I could avoid it, I've got to avoid it. And I'm thinking about my dad up there. And if he's looking down at me, he's looking at me saying, you go pay that parking meter. And I'm thinking, I guess I got to go pay the parking meter. But I'm thinking, this is crazy because there's, there's Bruce Springsteen and I'm in the front row. And I don't know, maybe I can meet him or I don't know. I don't know. But I can't do it. <laughs> because I'm from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And you could take the girl out of Pittsburgh, but you can't make the girl pay a parking ticket. <laughs> Something like that. So I get up. And I wave goodbye to David and he's like, what? Like, where are you going? What? And I leave and I get to my car and there's no parking ticket. Yay. And I drive home. I'm, I live very close to the city. I'm, I'm like, you know, 15 minutes later, I'm home. And I log on to Facebook and there's Lynette Carolla with her arm around Bruce Springsteen in the Shriner Auditorium because guess who just walked off the stage to say hello? Yeah, I missed my opportunity to meet the boss. 65 bucks. <sighs> anyway, I have regrets, that's for sure. <laughs> These are the things I think about before I go to sleep at night. God damn it, what was I thinking? But I know my dad is smiling down at me and he knows that I did the right thing. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right. That was fun. That was fun. Okay, you guys, we're going to keep the show rolling. We have two more storytellers left and then we're going to start Story Smash, the storytelling game show. So stick around for that for sure. All right, you guys, this next guy coming up, Greg, you will be thrilled to know that he is from down under. That's right. We've got an Aussie on the show. He's a really, really good person. He's making a big name for himself in Los Angeles as a comedian. He works full time at the Laugh Factory when we're not in a pandemic. Please welcome my friend from down under, Dan Green. How are we doing, folks? All right. So I have an accent. It's a very strong accent. All right. I'm from Australia, but I spent 17 years in Texas. Okay. So it's a little bit different. Also, I've got some lighting issues today. I'm not trying to look like a vampire. It's just that when I do this, I found you can see my face. This is a little bit bright, but that's what we're going with today anyway. So I don't have any Springsteen stories, so I'm just going to tell you a story from my army days. Uh, I joined the army in 95. 
back in 1995, I joined the army. And back then, they basically gave you your job at the end of your recruit training. At the end of my three months of recruit training, they said, right, the Australian army needs 26 cooks and six infantrymen. Now, I didn't, I didn't join the army to be a cook. I mean, they had a pretty bad reputation. We used to call them fitters and turners because they used to fit food into pots and turn into shit. That's how they got that nickname. So I didn't want to be a cook. So I fought real hard to be the dumbest guy in the room and go to infantry. And that worked out really well because that's where I headed. So I get sent to the School of Infantry right behind me here, Lone Pine Barracks in Singleton, just outside of Sydney. That's where I go for my infantry training. And I'm thinking, you know what? It's going to be a good day. Green Day's Welcome to Paradise is playing on the radio as the bus pulls up at the barracks. I'm like, that's awesome. That's a good sign. Problem was, I spent just a little bit too much time on the bottom step. And I looked around the base a little bit, and then I got grabbed, physically grabbed by the ears by a sergeant named Bung Latchman, who grabbed me by my ears and told me to get the fuck across the parade ground and stand still over there with everybody else. And I was like, oh, geez, I think I've made a big mistake. I've made a huge mistake. We get over there and then I meet the most terrifying man I've ever met. And that's what today's story is about. I meet a guy named Sergeant Bruce. Sergeant Bruce comes out. Let me look at how what he looks like. Sergeant Bruce comes out. Man's built like a brick shit house. All right. Built like a brick shit house. He's got Australia in huge letters tattooed across his back. He's only wearing a pair of rugby shorts. That's it. A pair of flip flops. And he's got infantry in huge letters across his chest. And I'm like, shit. And all I hear from behind me is this bloke behind me going, we should have gone to fucking Cooks, mate. I said, yeah, damn right, we should have gone to Cooks. Next morning, I find out how bad this is going to be. We line up. We're lined up outside of our bunks, all eight of us in our little section. And he, in walks Sergeant Bruce. Sergeant Bruce walks up to the first guy straight away and just goes, bang. Punches him, fair in the chest, drops this guy down like a bag of shit. Okay? I looked at him, I'm like, damn, he must hate that guy. Next day, he walks in, looks at the same soldier again, looks him up and down, takes a step to the right, looks at the next soldier, bang, boom, punches that guy, drops him like a bag of shit. It's at this point that I realize that there is a system to this. Okay? There is a system, and I'm, that, I'm day three. This went on for three months. Every, every, eight, every eight days, you got punched in the chest. There was his way of hardening everybody up. So I didn't like Sergeant Bruce from the start. Anyway, what he used to do was he'd run around in a white T-shirt. And then he'd come up to me all the time and he'd ask me if my weapon was clean. Green, is your weapon clean? I think so. Well, let me come and check. And then he'd grab his white T-shirt and he'd stick his finger up inside it and slide it up inside my weapon. And he'd come out with dirt every time. And he'd go, well, it doesn't look very clean, does it, son? Off to the bear pit for you. Now, the bear pit was this stagnant river, which was on our obstacle course. It was the worst water you can imagine. Two miles down the road. So I, here I go, two miles down the road, running down the road, running down the road. A long time ago, I haven't ran for a while now. Run down the road, put my weapon in the bear pit, come back up, come back up, Sergeant Bruce. Greg, come over here, show me your weapon. Shows it to me. It's filthy. He goes, geez, your weapon's filthy. That's perfect. Go clean it. He goes, Gee whiz, you look pretty clean. I'll be back in a second, Sergeant. Back down the road, two more miles, jump in the bear pit with my weapon this time, come back and then go and clean everything. That was the kind of prick this guy was. Well, I got him back one day. He used to do his laundry with us as well because he was a cheap bastard. So we'd do his laundry on base where we did our laundry. And he put those white t-shirts in the wash every second Tuesday. So this Tuesday, I decided to throw a red sock in there and his white t-shirts. I'm gonna ruin, ruin his whole getup. Destroyed his laundry. This man was just ropeable at the end of it all. Who did this? Who did this? And he finds the red sock. Now, here's the reason I didn't go to cook, so I wasn't very bright. I had a red sock, but we had to write our names on everything, okay? So my little regimental number is written in Sharpie on the bottom of my sock, which is now sitting inside this guy's laundry. Pissed, I tell you, absolutely pissed. I thought he was gonna kill me. Never been that close. So here's the thing. This is why it's a bad thing with Sergeant Bruce. Four years later, four years later, I'm in my unit. Now I'm a, now I'm a senior soldier. Now I'm respected, that kind of thing. 
We've been playing enemy for the Australian SAS for two weeks, being their bad guys so they can shoot us up all the time, being their protesters, that kind of thing, whatever they do, the anti-terrorist kind of thing. On the last day, everything's gone great. And on the last day, they take us all aside and they say, okay, some of you, we're going to give you a reward for dying so beautifully for the last two weeks. Some of you are going to go get the blow shit. Excuse me. Some of you are going to get the blow shit up over there. And some of you are going to get to go you yippy jumps over here. And I said, I don't know what a yippy jump is, but I want some of that. Throw me up for a yippy jump. I'm in for that. I get over there and find out that a yippy jump is actually a tandem skydive from 15,000 feet. I'm pretty excited about this. I've never gone skydiving in my life. So I get up there. I get up there. <laughs> I go across to the guy. I said, radio. And there was a guy named Barry who'd been packing parachutes for like two weeks. He's been around the army for 20 years. Well, Barry got shot in the ear with a rubber bullet the day before, which is exactly like getting shot in the ear with a bullet the day before. So Barry's out of commission. So now there's this guy named Toby who's going to be packing my chute. And Toby's been doing it about two weeks. He just graduated shoot packing school or whatever the hell you call that place. So I'm kind of shitting bricks right about now. I asked Toby, I said, well, where's my jumpsuit? Don't I get one of those fancy suits, like the wingsuit kind of thing? He goes, nah, nah, mate. Just jump in what you're wearing. I looked at him. I'm wearing, I'm wearing a pair of short rugby shorts and a tank top with a pair of flip-flops. And I said, to, he says, oh, yeah, just leave the flip-flops on the ground, mate. They're not going to make it, buddy. I'm like, all right, no worries. So now I'm doing my first tandem skydive. I'm barefoot with a harness attached to me in a pair of rugby shorts and a tank top, which is barely on. And I go, okay, who am I jumping with? And who do you think walks around the corner but fucking Sergeant Bruce Green? You, the man who fucked up my laundry. I haven't seen you in four years. He said, I said, Sergeant Bruce, nice to see you again, sir. He goes, how much do you weigh? I said, about 240 pounds. And he goes, so do I. He said, me and you, we're going to fucking plummet. We're going to get down way quicker than everybody else. This is going to be the best skydive ever. I go, no, I'm fucking I'm terrified. I'm shaking right now. I've got PTSD from this thing. Okay. So now I get, so now I've got, now I've got the parachute that should have been packed by Barry, but was packed by Toby. And I've got Sergeant Bruce attached to my back. And now I'm in a tiny little pissy plane called a caribou. And I'm heading up to 15,000 feet. And I'm shitting myself the whole way up. And we're about to get out. And Sergeant Bruce is real excited. But there's a secret that Sergeant Bruce not, doesn't know yet. I'm free balling in those rugby shorts. I was going commando that day. I didn't intend to jump out of a plane. So when I had to put the harness on, I had to make a very, very interesting decision. I had to figure out where to put everything. And I went with the meat and two vegetable approach to lining everything up. So I've got my balls on, balls on one side and the strap on the other as I'm sitting there about to jump out of a plane. We hurl out of the plane. Does two somersaults out the back door. I almost lose my mind. And then my balls get sucked to the side of my thigh with a kind of fury that you've never heard in your life. For the next 45 seconds, my nuts are getting sandblasted at terminal velocity, 180 miles an hour. They're hanging out the bottom of these shorts because I'm getting a massive wedgie. I'm dying. I'm yelling out, my nuts, my nuts, my nuts. And all I can hear behind me is fucking Sergeant Bruce with his pink underwear going, yeah, this is fucking crazy. This is nuts. I, all I want him to do is just pop the damn chute so I can get my hand down there and tuck everything back to where it should be. It's red roll. <laughs> He pops the shoot. I'm like, thank God, I can reach up. We're good. I can reach down. I go to reach down to grab my balls. I can't reach down because the harness is too tight. I can only reach down like this. Oh, my God. So now I'm thinking, just end this thing. End it. Get me the ground. How can this day get any worse? It can't get any worse. And then I look down, and I see... 600 elementary school kids that have hung out to watch Sergeant Bruce and his friends jump out of planes. And all they could see are my fucking battered red nuts hanging out the side of my short shorts as I coast nice and slowly to the ground. Oh. That was Sergeant Bruce. He's the most terrifying man I've ever met. I'm still scared of him. Okay.
Christine, it's been fantastic. That's the end of my story. Um, I'm so happy. I'm happy I could be here today and share that with you guys. Uh, thank you very much. My name is Dan Green. <laughs> Dan Green, you guys. Dan Green. That was a terrific story. Holy cow. Now, I went skydiving like that one time too, the tandem thing. Yeah. And yeah, it's like guys on my back. And we did the flip out of the plane. And it was like 10,500 feet. That's yeah, where we jumped yeah, you, from. How, they they get you right up there. Where were you? How, how high? 15, I, was at, I was at 15,000 in a pair of shorts. <laughs> I wore shorts, but I don't have the problem you did. And I am well, sorry to hear that. I wish they had warned you. They should have told you to wear a jock strap or something. The, the, the safety brief was about 10 seconds long. Our, really? Uh, those, those guys really didn't give a shit. It was great. The funny but thing did, is, I actually, went, I actually went back up there and jumped six more times that day, so it was really cool. But didn't you have to sign away your life, as it were, like, you know, in terms of what you sign away, in terms oh, of... Oh, no, 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 these are, these are the Special Forces guys. They were doing this out of the back of a truck. They really, they had nothing going. <laughs> That's hilarious. Nobody died. Well, I'm glad you're okay, Dan Green. I'm super glad you're okay. Still and here. That's the main to, thing. You're glad you're going to be playing stories. I can't wait. But you guys, right now, our final storyteller, she's an amazing woman. She has had stand-up specials on HBO, Comedy Central, and Logo. She's written and starred in two critically acclaimed off-Broadway hit shows, The Judy Show, My Life is a Sitcom, and 25 Questions for a Jewish Mother. And she's won two Emmy Awards for writing and producing The Rosie O'Donnell Show. It's just amazing. She's had such an incredible career, and she keeps going. She has a brand-new book out right now that it's called, Yes, I Can Say That. When they come for the comedians, we're all in trouble. It is a fantastic read, honestly. It's all about censorship, and I think this book should be required reading, especially if you have a teenager. I'll put the link in the chat room where you can purchase it right now. Okay, you guys, wherever you are, put your hands together for the phenomenal Judy Gold. Hi! Hi, everyone. I'm Judy Gold, and I was struggling with what story to tell tonight, but I really want to tell this story. Um, so, uh, as Christine said, I had two uh, off-Broadway shows. Um, when I was, I guess, right after my second son was born, Ben, I really wanted to do uh, a theater piece. And I decided, okay, I, I don't want it to be stand-up comedy with music. Like a lot of comics will go into a theater and they'll just zhuzh up their stand-up and give it a name. I wanted to tell a story. So I had just become a Jewish mother for the second time. And I went out to dinner with a playwright friend of mine, Kate. And uh, we were, but she was in, I was working in Chicago at probably at Zany's or, oh, I think the Funny Firm. I don't know, if, I'm sure Proops remembers the Funny Firm. Anyway, so I'm at the Funny Firm and uh, I wanna kill myself. And my friend Kate's there cause her, her wife, well, partner at the time, is a big literary agent and she was there for some book thing. And uh, I met them at some hotel and Lori was out like, you know, being Lori. And I was sitting with Kate and she's drank at the time. She doesn't drink anymore. And I said, listen, I really want to do a one person show. And she said, well, and she's a playwright. And I said, and she said, well, what would it be about? And I said, well, you know, I keep getting crap from the Jewish press about doing my mother and, 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 um, you know, imitating my mother. And I had done the Tonight Show and uh, someone from the Jewish Daily Forward was like, you're promoting a stereotype. I'm like, I'm talking like my mother. I talk like, I'm doing, this is what she said and this is how she said it. So if you think that's a stereotype, then fine, go live in your self-hating Jew apartment on the Upper West Side, surrounded by other self-hating Jews. So, fine. So I was discussing this with her and the fact that, you know, uh, am I going to become my mother? So we started on this journey. We interviewed all these Jewish mothers. And originally the whole show was about, is the stereotype real? You know, and then through interviewing all these women, it, I realized that, you know, they were all completely different and that it was a journey. And when I got, and I, and, and the way we sort of made the play work was that I would get to a part, part in my life where I'm asking myself a question 
and I have one of the Jewish mothers answer the question because we had asked them 20, we actually asked them 50 questions and then we had to cut it down because they wouldn't shut the fuck up and we were there for like hours. Okay, so we do this play and it is, um, we do it in, first we do it in Seattle at the Empty Space Theater and uh, we have, uh, we get a review and I, you know, I was told never to read reviews and I wasn't in the theater. So I was like, okay, I won't read a review, but I was sneaking the review. But this, this one review was, it, it said something about, you know, her mother is so hysterical in the show. And I don't, I don't understand why she's so hysterical. Now, granted we're in Seattle. I mean, how many like annoying, loud overprotective Jewish mothers are in Seattle. I mean, seriously, we're depressed enough. We don't, you know, need to be in cloudy, rainy weather all the time. So we like the desert. <laughs> anyway, so they, they said, uh, you know, I, I just, that was the one thing we took from the review was that why is her mother so crazy and overprotective? So we ended up adding a monologue, a question to my mother, she because I had interviewed my mother also for the show, and the monologue explains uh, why my mother is so overprotective. Because her brother, who uh, she grew up in Manhattan, she grew up on uh, West Ninety Fourth Street, and I live on West Ninety Second Street. And um, when she she went to Julia Richmond High School, Lauren Bacool was in her class. Well, Betty Persky. And uh, she had a younger brother, two years younger, and a younger sister, seven years younger. And her brother went to Brooklyn Tech. My mother went to Julia Richmond. And at this time, her, her sister was in middle school. And this was 1939. And her, her brother, Stuart, was playing ball with his friends outside of this apartment building on 89th Street. And the doorman came out and said, listen, you can't play ball here. Uh, you you, you got to get out. You got to go play somewhere else. And he then grabbed my mother's brother's um, jacket. It was on the hood of a car. Meanwhile, it was June and he has a jacket. So there it goes, you know, Jewy Jewman. Um, and he grabs my, my, my uncle's jacket. He's 15 at the time. And he goes into the lobby with the jacket and I guess he's playing keep away with the, you know, the super's granddaughter. And my uncle reaches for the jacket and the doorman pushes him and he falls back, hits his head on the marble floor and dies. And this story I had never known until I was visiting my grandmother when I was 18 and I opened a drawer um, and I found his obituary. And I, no one talked about him, no one. So I ended up putting this story in the show. And we ended up opening the show at Ars Nova Theater a couple of years later. We did even more work on the show and it became this huge hit. It was like, you know, that really, that one review changed the whole show, put humanizing my mother. And because she was, you know, she's always been a part of my act and it's, she's always been hysterical, but that really told the story of where this hysteria came from. And if, if I were to go deeper into this, I would say that all Jewish mothers are hysterical because from generation to generation to generation, we've been kicked out of countries and, um, you know, all that anxiety just goes la door va door, generation to generation. So we do the show um, and I'm really nervous. Like I know nothing about, you know, theater and one person shows, but I'm in a legit theater, Ars Nova, which, you know, if you look up Ars Nova after this, you'll see, you know, Lin-Manuel Miranda in the Heights was done there. I mean, they, they, they were the incubator for so many things, but this was like their first big show. And 
I, the way the show was structured was, you know, there was, I would talk, I, you know, in the middle of the stage, there was a chair where I would become the women. I literally became the women and, and, and did them. I became them and answered these questions. And we have opening night. And, you know, I talk very honestly in that show about growing up in New Jersey and in the suburbs and how much I fucking hated it. Uh, I was six feet tall when I was 13. I just really didn't like it, you know? And I talk about, you know, I just, it, it, was, it was a very well put together. There were no like dead spaces, uh, but I'm brutally honest about my not liking growing up in New Jersey. So the New York Times review comes out after the first preview and it is a rave. A rave beyond rave beyond rave, 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 rave like perfect. Um, and everyone's like, oh my God, you don't understand how good this is. And I really didn't because I'm, you know, comic like sitting in the fucking, you know, next to the bathroom in the fucking owner's office waiting to go on smelling shit, you know. And uh, everyone was like, oh my God, this is the greatest thing. You know what I'm saying? And all of a sudden the show is like packed. Every night there were people sitting on the stage. It was amazing. And then the New Jersey Star Ledger. Now I was getting a bunch of reviews, um, but the New Jersey Star Ledger came to the show. That's my hometown paper. It's like a New Jersey paper, but it's like the big New Jersey paper. And they come to the review and this, uh, they come to the show and the guy does this review and it's not good. I mean, it doesn't matter because the New York Times is the only, but it was like my hometown paper couldn't give me a good review. So I was at a photo shoot. I was, you know, when you do these shows, you know, it's like, you know, it's, I mean, anyone who's on this stage with us uh, knows that, you know, you get a show and then it's all publicity and photo shoots and everyone loves you. And then, you know, your life is shit like a month later, no one calls you and you want to fucking kill yourself. So uh, I'm at a photo shoot and I remember the publicist for the show, her name was Candy. She was lovely. She's still lovely. And I'm getting this photos taken and Candy starts, runs over to me in the middle of this photo shoot she runs over to me and she's like, Judy, Judy, I have to talk to you. I have to talk to you. I said, what? She's like, apparently your mother called the reviewer from the Star Ledger and left a message. He's not calling her back, but your mother cannot call people who don't give you good reviews and yell at them. And I was like, oh my God, I'm so sorry. I, I'm so sorry. I was like, and I'm like, oh my God, I can't believe my mother did this. I mean, she was always, she would always stick up for me, but this is like fucking ridiculous. So I call up my mother. I said, Ma, did you call the, the reviewer from the Star Ledger? Yes, I did. Okay, Ma, you can't call people who give me bad reviews. It's just not, it, you, you can't, you just gotta let it go. Judith, yeah, I uh, read the review, that, which I do not agree with. And this is pre-internet and everything. And at the end of the review, it says his name and his phone number. If you have any comments or questions, you can reach me in my office. And I had comments and I had to listen to his opinion and he can listen to mine. Oh, I just spit. And he can listen to mine. And I was like, you're right. He left his phone number, fine. And in that moment, I was like, oh my God, I fucking love my mother so much. The guy never called her back. He was so afraid of her. And a few years later, I did my next show, The Judy Show, My Life is a Sitcom. And he gave me a good review. Ah. <laughs> Perfect. Oh, wow. That's so exciting, Judy. Wow. 
you've done so many tremendous things, really. I mean, from- Especially gain weight. Yeah. Ah, come on. You are beautiful. You're so beautiful. I love those glasses, by the way. They're Thank very you. Cool Thank on you. you. Yeah, they're very cool. And, and so is there anything, let me just ask, and then we're going we're gonna to start the game show, but is there anything else you really want to do, Judy? Yes! I know, I know, but I mean, so you wrote this book, which is fantastic. What else do you really need to do? What do you want to do? Okay. Okay. First of all, I want to make enough money so that I don't have to worry about money ever. I don't want to be, I don't need to be a fucking billionaire. Just want to never have to think about, oh, I need to get this. And it's not an issue. I don't right. want a huge mansion. I don't want that. I don't want all that. I just want to, that's number one. Okay. I want to be on Broadway uh, in a serious play. Oh, really? That's interesting. I did Shakespeare in the Park, but uh, yeah, I'd like to be on Broadway. I would love to be uh, on a socially relevant television show. Yeah. I really want to be, yeah. you know, like my goal, I always wanted to be Rhoda Morgan Stern or, you know, I want to be on a show that is a part of people's lives that's really well written. I really, I really want to do that. Um, I mean, I have so, I want a talk show. I want, there's so much shit I want to do. But I know, I, I understand what you're saying. And I think you're going to get it all because you have- I'm time. 97 years old. <laughs> you look good for 97, Judy Thanks. Gold. Thank you. Hey, listen, stick around for Story Smash because you're one of the celebrity expert judges. And you guys, I want to give a big thank you to everybody who played the game tonight. What a fantastic night. Uh, there she is, Eugenia Kuzmina. Where are you, Eugenia? There you are. And Dan Green. Thank you, Dan. And of course, Greg Proops. Big round of applause for Greg Proops. He always brings it. And he's going to be judging Story Smash as well. And of course, the beautiful and talented Judy Gold. Thank you, Judy. I hope you guys can all tune into Story Worthy this week. My guest is comedian Bobby Oliver, and she talks about some cyber stalking, and it is pretty ugly, but the story's great. So tune into that, you guys. I really appreciate it. And so one more time on behalf of all the storytellers tonight, my name is Christine Blackburn. Good night. I place my own bets and I make my own deals. Thanks for joining us on the Story Worthy Podcast. We'll be back next week with all new stories. Subscribe to Story Worthy on iTunes and visit the Story Worthy website at storyworthypodcast.com. I'll keep you safe.